Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 and our chats with Emily as we're calling our readings of the poetry of Emily Dickinson, especially the poems contained in the Johnson edition, all 1,775 poems. Well, that's our goal anyway. We are closing in on poem 100. We're in poem 98, which is a, a, a you know a kind of a, a, a major feat of its own. Uh, poem 98, One Dignity Delays for All. I find this a truly remarkable little poem. By the way, this was one of the 14 poems selected for publication by T.W. Higginson um, to the Christian Union uh, magazine in 1890. And it's another death poem. It's another funeral poem. And it asks the question, what is the day of one's actual funeral life? But what I find here is I love the syntax of this poem. And you'll hear it when I read it. it Emily intentionally creates language that forces us to kind of slow down the way some kind of um, you know funeral ceremony, especially one that would be grandiose, would maybe play it out. Um, there is uh, all kinds of, of interesting study as well on this poem about the way uh, in which is Emily being serious or is she being ironic and sarcastic in her wonderful Emily kind of way? Um, notice that we'll have six exclamation points in this one. I find, I read this poem predominantly as sarcastic, as satiric. And, uh, uh, and although there is that spontaneous uh, kind of beat, uh, and I think Emily's doing it intentionally, I think in the end there's enough giveaways here. Again, Emily loving her riddles that we're going to find that I don't, I'm not sure that she is celebrating this funeral procession at all. I think that as we were commenting in an earlier poem uh, when we were talking about it together that I think that uh, there's other other ways that uh, she celebrates the passing of an individual in poem 93 um, went up this uh, year this e went up a year this evening she writes about a man who died a year a year ago he didn't die with all the pomp that she's going to talk and celebrate here our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at learnstrong.net down that left hand side chats with Emily our playlist we made some introductory comments I hope that you've already studied and we've worked through the preceding 97 poems we just finished with The Rainbow Never Tells Me. Let's enjoy this poem. One dignity delays for all, one mitered afternoon. None can avoid this purple, none evade this crown. Coach it in sewers and footmen, chamber and state and throng. Bells also in the village as we ride grandly along. What dignified attendance, what service when we pause, how loyally at parting their hundred hats they raise, how pomp surpassing ermine when simple you and I present our meek ascushin and claim the rank to die. Now, this is of course a poem about a funeral. And is it a funeral celebration or is it a critique of a funeral celebration? Well, let's take a look at it. Notice all the monosyllabic words in this poem, right? One, one, none, none, crown, coach, chamber. Uh, will play as well with the first letter sounds. So notice there's a marching kind of sense here, right? One dignity delays for all one mitered afternoon. None can avoid this purple. None evade this crown. So you've got that kind of rhythm game going on. And obviously... I mean, you know, a, a funeral procession, especially for somebody who is important. Notice the word pop's going to get used a little bit later. Um, but then she's going to talk a little bit later beyond that about you and I as being simple. So I, I think, and Meek, this is going to be an interesting poem for us to study. We'll begin with the word dignity. And this is the only time in her poetry she uses this word. Dignity delays. Hear all the echoes sounds. Dignity delays. Um, uh, uh, avoid, evade, I mean, all the way through this poem. It got these interesting sounds. It's a wonderful poem that we can study at the sound level, right? Dignity, one dignity delays for all. In other words, when you die, this is your, for many people, their greatest moment, even though they can't enjoy it themselves. It's left, obviously, to spectators. One mitered afternoon, the only time mitered gets used in Emily's poetry. Of course, this is the the, the headdress of the bishop, the, the pomp of, of it all will be later, right? One mitered afternoon, none can avoid this purple, none can evade this crown, exclamation point, right? In other words, this is a ceremony that we cannot look past or beyond. And of course, 
when we studied our Walt Whitman and we went to the drum taps and we of course did Lilacs Last and all of that in Talks with Walt, we commented on that most famous of all funerals in American history and of course the somberness of it all. But the language here seems to evoke a certain kind of, I'm not going to call it cynicism, but it certainly is going to be a certain kind of testy voice. Notice, couch, a uh, coach, it ensures, and footman, the, again, the show, the, 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 pomp, the, pomp, the bombacity, the show of it all. Chamber and state and throng. Bells also in the village as we ride grand along. I think the word grand here is a significant word as we pay attention to it. Now, the use of the word we is fascinating because we'll get to another we here in a moment. What dignified attendance, what service, when we pause again, notice this repetition of certain words here. What service when we pause? How loyally at parting their hundred hats they raise. So in other words, everyone is taking off their hats to show a certain kind of respect for the one who has died. It's the last, I mean up to this point it's really just been a description with obviously some very important word choice, but it's this last stanza that will lead any number of people to, to kind of begin to debate what exactly is going on here. How pomp Surpa surpassing ermine, those ceremonial robes. Ermine will get used already in poem fi uh, 15. We're going to see it again in 117, 151, 166, 704, 961. We'll use this uh, ermine word again. Notice it's not pompous, it's just pomp. But as, as uh, Wisher has pointed out in his analysis of this set of lines, Emily sometimes likes to do this, where she'll create a phrase so it's not clear. Is she talking about pomp or is she talking about pompous? Right. That is to say, celebration, which is maybe a little bit too much over the top. We're going to hear the word pomp, by the way, in poems. Uh, we already heard it in poem 87. We're going to hear it in uh, poems 582 and 666 as well. You can study how she uses this word. How pomp surpassing ermine when simple you and I present our meek escutcheon. That is to say, the shield. Escutcheon only gets used one time in all of her poetry, and it is here. I can't help but think that she's somehow channeling Homer's classic Iliad. And you'll remember in Iliad 18, we give in full lectures at LearnStrong.net, you'll remember that there's this whole thing at the end of the Iliad about the, the important ceremonies, obviously the death of Patroclus. There's going to be the whole thing about the, the, uh, uh, the shield of Achilles, right, before he goes to fight against Hector. And then, of course, the final lines of the Iliad, they buried Hector, tamer of horses, and the idea of the need for ostentation and performance, if you will, in the moment of death. How pumps surpassing our mind when simple you and I present our meek escutcheon and claim the rank to die. Now, there seems to be, in some ways, a juxtaposition here between those who deserve a certain kind of pomp ceremony at their death, in their funeral. And then she says, you and I. In other words, normal people. Normal people don't get this. That's one reading. Um, let's go to 2A really quickly. Well, I think that, you know, there's a number of ways to read this, depending upon how you interpret the word pomp. I think that people often will gain their greatest recognition in death. Um, and is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? To what degree does Emily celebrate this idea as opposed to maybe being a bit sarcastic? At to me, I love the slow rhythm of this poem. Go back and read it on your own again and just hear how she forces you to slow down. I love the word choice. I love the language of pomp and ceremony. Dignity only gets used one time and it's here. Um, but I also love the sarcastic, the ironic, the satiric voice that I think is seeping in all the way through this. Um, David Priest, in his um, uh, discussion, has commented that in the novel Anne of Green Gables, um, Lucy Maud Montgomery's uh, classic, uh, that uh, with the death of Matthew, um, it says this, quote, For the first time in his life, Matthew Cobert was a person of central importance. The white majesty of death had fallen upon him and set him apart as one crowned, end quote. Um, now, again, I like the idea of reading this as it relates to Emily's critique of Homer, especially the Iliad. She's doing this all the time. But my Emily crew wanted me to suggest that they think there's a whole lot of the myth of Hades and Persephone going on here in this. And this is a brilliant insight from my Emily crew that you'll remember Hades will capture Persephone and take her in a coach or a chariot 
down into the underworld. And there's this juxtaposition then between being a nobody up on the earth and then, of course, being the queen of the underworld in, in, in the afterlife and, and down in Hades. It's a fascinating way to, I think, as well read this poem, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the way that they took, took a look at it as well. Do you remember, it just did another 3A, do you remember in our study of Hamlet that it, it's interesting that Polonius has been killed by Hamlet? And Laertes will return, and he, the, the thing that seems to upset him the most is not that his father was, was murdered by Hamlet, you know, by sticking the sword through the, uh, uh, through the arrears, through the curtain and all that, but rather, what's up with the funeral? Why didn't he get more ostentation in his funeral? And then he'll ask the same question about Ophelia when they are burying Ophelia. Um, I think Emily is channeling some of those notions about what is a really well-lived life? Do we have to have a major ceremony to be understood as having lived a well-lived life? Now, obviously, there are some who deserve that. We think of Abraham Lincoln, of course. And then there's others, maybe she's going to ask, is it really that necessary or is it better just to live a simple, a meek life, as she will say? Finally, at 3B, well, how about you? I mean, when you think about yourself and it's time to go bye-bye because we can't swing at the park forever, you've not met any 200-year-old folks, which means the van's always waiting. Children had to learn it as a, at a young age. We all did. I don't want to leave the park. I want us to continue to swing. No, honey, you got to go to the van. But the going to the van and, and, and the, the performance of a funeral and all of that, it, have you given any thought about how you would like for that? And, of course, it's interesting to study Emily's funeral herself. Thank you.